Hello, hello, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out, and uh, thank you for Cherie and Glenn, and I'm probably leaving somebody else and getting our lunch together. Thank you so much. Can we give them a hand? <clears throat> Those tzatziki's chicken wraps are some of my favorite. Uh, they're so good. Hey, I um, want to let you know kind of what, uh, how the, the afternoon is going to go. Sandra is going to share some more kind of technical details, nuts and bolts from the, from the book. Uh, and I, I know many of you bought it. It is just so good. And I just thought, man, I'm going to be giving this, this book to so many young parents. Um, in fact, I have thought about baby dedication it, we might need to give them a copy of a book. You dedicate your baby here, we'll give you a book. Um, that, that sounds like a deal. Did I just put that in the budget? Um, I think I just put that in the budget. <clears throat> um, because I just, it is, is really good. There's so many great things. So she's going to go through that. I've also sent her a few questions that I would love for her to just kind of answer that, that I had as I read the book. Um, because even times have changed, right? Because now we're, if you're raising kids now, you're raising them in this digital world and the things that they learned on the other side of the book or the other side of raising kids. And then we want to have an opportunity for you to ask questions. So we're passing out some little note cards, some index cards and pens, and would love for you, this is totally anonymous, uh, or you can give us your name and social security number if you like. But it's, a, it's a, a, just a chance for you to ask any questions you have. And I've asked some of our staff team that have kids at different stages uh, to, uh, to answer some questions um, and be, be on the panel here. Um, so, yeah, so we'd love for you to, to, be, uh, to ask questions there. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll have folks raise their hands. So without further ado, we're going to welcome Sandra up to talk about four stages of parenting and everything else that she wants to share. So let's give her a hand. All right. So these are the diehards in here now. <clears throat> yep. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to dive right in. As we talked about this morning a little bit, if you were here, um, every parent is parenting in a direction, whether they realize it or not. It might be an obedience direction or an academic direction or, you know, a sports direction or whatever, but um, every parent is parenting in a direction. And as we said this morning, direction determines destination. And Andy and I t use this phrase all the time, direction determines destination, because it's true in so many different arenas of life, not just parenting. <clears throat> it's true in every category. And again, it can be wonderful if you're parenting in a good direction. It can be scary if you're accidentally not. Um, and if you don't choose your direction ahead of time, you may end up parenting in a direction that you would not have chosen had you paused and thought about it and chosen the direction um, that you wanted to go in. So like other categories of life, we decided to choose our direction ahead of time. And um, our bullseye on the target was simply the idea that we wanted to raise kids who wanted to be with us and with each other, even when they no longer had to be. And that meant that we focused on relationship, relationship. We, that meant that we focused in every season of parenting on raising, loving, discipline, training, coaching, all the things with relationship in mind. And at the core of our parenting, that's what we were focused on. With all the other decisions we were having to make, everything that was coming our way, it went through the grid of relationship. Um, though very important, behavior modification was not our primary uh, focus. Neither was success at sports or academic excellence or even peace in our household. Those were not the main things, but those things are, of course, important. And they have a place. But at the end of the day, when we were faced with hard parenting decisions or calendar issues, which is a big thing for parents of multiple children, of course, or travel opportunities or for us ministry opportunities for, for y'all maybe job opportunities, the question simply became, is this good for our relationship? So any opportunity that came our way, any kind of decision that came our way, is this good for our relationships? That became the filter through which we made so many parenting decisions. And we did that because we wanted to parent our kids in a relationship way. Relationship with their Heavenly Father, our marriage relationship, all the decisions that we made, we wanted to make sure our, we we're healthy with our Heavenly Father, our marriage is healthy, and our relationship with our kids are healthy. 
So for this afternoon, I wanted to talk about a few nuts and bolts things that Andy and I learned in our journey. Um, some of the things we learned, we learned the hard way by doing it wrong. Um, sometimes that's the best teacher, right? Doing it the wrong way and you realize, yeah, we are not going to do that again. Um, some of the things we learned be from other parents because we, um, we were in student ministry for a long time. And so we could identify parents that were getting it right at home. We could tell, you know, they had a great relationship with their kids. They seemed to be prioritizing their, their lives correctly. So we basically would stalk them, harass them, bribe them, you know, whatever it took to be able to have some time and just, you know, just glean wisdom from them. And then some of the things we learned in our parenting journey, we just kind of figured out, right? So learn some things the hard way, learn things from other people, learn things the hard um, just as we went to. Um, one thing that was really big for us, Andy and I have been in small groups our entire marriage. We got in a small group with young couples when we were in our young season of life. We were in small groups with different couples, you know, through the years as we were raising our kids. And even now as empty nesters, we're still in small group. It is such an important thing for us. And in those early years of parenting, we did every single parenting curriculum under the sun. We, we wanted to get this right so badly, and we were information people. Andy and I are both motivated by information. And so we did, read all the books, we did all the studies, we did all the things that were available at the time. And one of the first things that we learned from somebody else, we didn't make this up, was the stages of parenting. And it sounded important to us, like as a framework for parenting. And we, as we got into the weeds of parenting, we realized this is way more important than we even, than we even knew ahead of time. Um, we learned that it was so important for framing our approaches to discipline, our approaches to conversations with our kids as they progress through different seasons of life. You don't relate to a 13-year-old the way you relate to a five-year-old. Obviously, those are intuitive ideas, but the practical part behind it sometimes isn't quite as intuitive. And so, um, we learned that if we could understand the stages of parenting and then adjust our approaches for discipline, for conversations, for what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do based on those different seasons of life, that that would be great. So I want to talk about each one of the four seasons, four stages of parenting um, as it was taught to us. And I just want to talk about some of the unique things about each of those stages. And then I want to give you the rookie mistake in each one of those stages, and then talk about spiritual formation for our kids for each of those stages. So the four stages of parenting um, are the discipline years, that's like zero to five years old. The training years is like five to 12 years old. The coaching years are like 12 to 18. And then the friendship years, 18 and forward. So let's start with the discipline years. And I'll go through all these kind of kind of quickly, and then we can um, do some Q and A and bring and bring the panel up for some other questions. But so the discipline years, zero to five years old, these are the years where we're teaching our kids that there are consequences for their actions. That's like the overarching lesson of zero to five years old. Are the, the things that we do in life have consequences, right? Good consequences, bad consequences, and for their good and for their safety, we just need them to obey right? Zero to five, we really just need our kids to obey. We're teaching them for their safety, for their good, we need them to obey. In this season, consistency is the key and immediacy is important. Um, you have to address things quickly with younger kids, obviously, because they don't remember, you know, the next day or three days later, or sometimes even three hours later, things have to happen fast. This can be a pretty exhausting season. If you've been in this season, you know, if you're in the season now, you know, this can be a pretty exhausting season. I remember telling my mom when Andrew was a baby, our oldest one, when he was a baby, I said, mom, this is the most constant thing I've ever done in my life. You know, everything else kind of has a start and an end. Parenting doesn't. It has a start. It does not have an end. And so I just thought, oh, my word, this is just the most constant thing I've ever done. Um, 
And as I mentioned in the, um, this morning, we disciplined, especially in this season, for the three Ds, disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. And the reason we disciplined for those is because on the other side of all three of those offenses, a relationship is impacted or hurt or broken. And so those were the things that we disciplined for. We corrected and coached our children through childishness. We disciplined for disobedience dishonesty, and disrespect. So that is the discipline years. You know, we just need them to obey, right? The rookie mistake in the discipline years is thinking things are cute that are not cute and assuming they'll grow out of them on their own and that discipline isn't necessarily important. And that is such a huge rookie mistake. For parents who've been around the block already, they're like, you, you got that right. We're watching our children, grandparents, you know, we're watching our grandchildren and everybody's thinking it's cute. When you're a grandparent, you can think it's cute, okay? So you can, and, you, and it's okay. And it is cute when you're a grandparent. But if you're the parent, discipline those, during those discipline years because it will pay good dividends. The faith element during the discipline years. I think this is such a wonderful time to begin introducing your children to Jesus Christ and to their heavenly father. This is a wonder, they're little sponges, you know, at this age. And so, and the, we, we, through every season of our parenting, made sure our kids had age-appropriate Bibles. During this season, little picture, storybook, you know, story Bibles are so great. So during this season, reading Bible stories to your kids, being strategic about other things with just little life principles and lessons, you know, while they're young and can, um, whatever is age-appropriate um, is so great. Praying together. This is when you start praying with your kids, and your kids will never remember not praying as a family if you start this early. One of the main things we did with our kids during this early, early season was to be on our knees by their bedside praying with them every night. And um, one of the prayers that they learned early, I mean, they had this memorized so early, was, Lord, would you give me the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right even when it's hard? That was one of our biggest prayers during those years with our kids. Lord, would you give us, it's a prayer that we still pray for ourselves. Lord, would you give us the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. And that even when it's hard part gets more and more important the older they get. Because if they are willing during their middle school and high school years to do what's right, even when they're the only one or even when it's hard, it, this is just prayer is just a great foundation to prepare for that. The training years, five to 12 years old, um, training years are a little bit different. This is where you're beginning to put the why behind the what. Our kids are able to reason a little bit as they get older, and so we start reasoning with them and explaining things. We're kind of explaining while we're training. Um, in this season, we're, here's what we're saying to our kids. Here's what we do. Here's why we do it. Now let's practice it and make it a habit. That's kind of the overarching kind of thesis of this, this little chunk of years. Here's what we do. Here's why we do it, why it's important. And now let's practice that and turn it into a habit. We're explaining while we're training and we're training a lot. This is a big stretch of years. This is the majority of the years of them being in your home, five to 12 years old. Um, in this season, in this stage, Andy and I practiced everything with our kids. Melissa mentioned that this morning. We practiced everything with our kids. You can get away in this season with turning everything into a game, and they love it because everything is fun and nothing is dumb. They turn 12. Everything is dumb and nothing is fun. Okay, so strike while you can, turn everything to a, into a game and practice with your kids. We would have guests for dinner and we would, Andy would go outside or I would and we'd ring the doorbell and our kids would practice answering the door, making eye contact, getting their hand out like a gun, you know, just quick draw and shaking hands. And you know, our kids just loved, I mean, they loved all of that. And consequently, they know how to make eye contact and meet somebody new as adults. They're great. They make a great first impression. They had so much practice practice, getting their hand out there and introducing themselves and looking people in the eyes. So practice everything. 
Um, let's say redos. During the training years, redos are a big deal. There were so many times our kids would use bad manners or they would respond harshly to something and we would say, oh, oh, oh let's rewind, let's rewind and have a redo and we would give them another opportunity and usually, unless they were just in a foul mood, they would get it right, you know, the second time. Um, the rookie mistake in this season the rookie mistake in the training years, expecting our kids to behave publicly in ways that they have not been trained for privately. Expecting our kids to behave in a certain way publicly when we have not trained them toward that privately. The faith element, and that's why practicing is so important. Um, the faith element, I think, in this season is so important. And this one is longer because there's so much. Again, this is the bulk of their years in your home. Um, keep praying together. And, and that same prayer that we prayed when they were little, we prayed that right through all of these years. Give me the wisdom to know what's right, the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. Another prayer we introduced during the training years was for our kids to begin asking God to show them his will for their lives. So one of their prayers became, God, would you just show me your will for my life? We wanted our kids to understand that God created them, that he loves them, and that he has a plan for their lives. And praying with our kids is a great way to export that truth. And so we would pray with them, and then they began praying, putting words around it for themselves. Lord, would you please show me your will for my life? And it's another way, too, of helping us help them um, put them, themselves for a lifetime under the authority of God, that God has a plan for them. And that really there is no, we've all learned this. And if we have, if you haven't, it's a great lesson to take away today. There is no true joy outside of the will of your heavenly father. He has a plan for your life. And during these training years is such a beautiful time for our kids to be able to begin understanding that. Um, this is the season of life where we want to model certain things for them. We want our kids to see how our personal faith intersects with our daily life. You want to model for your kids, how does my faith, how, the, how does the expression of my faith intersect with the decisions I'm making day to day, the things I say yes to? This is when your kids begin to see how your faith informs your life, how your faith informs your work life, how your faith informs your habits, how your faith informs what you choose for entertainment, what you binge watch, what you watch, what you listen to. Um, your kids begin seeing how your faith informs your private behaviors, your social media behavior, your temper, all of those things. That is modeling for our kids what it means to be a Jesus follower. When we model for our kids our faith intersecting with our real daily life, they walk away with a faith that is real. Um, and, and they see the intersection of that. The roots of your children's faith have a better chance of going deep and sustaining through their teenage years and their college years and their young adult years when your faith isn't just something you talk about or do on Sunday, but it is actually how you live. That will make the biggest impact on the future of your children's faith. Um, the coaching years, 12 to 18, um, I don't know if this is a real word, but I think these are the trepidatious years, you know, where you know, on, the fir on the front side of it, you're looking at it going, oh, no, I don't know. It's like the, the, the screen machine at Six Flags, you know, and you're going up and you're going up real slow and you're seeing it and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then, you know, then you're in it. So that's kind of like the coaching years. Let us pray. <laughs> no. Um, so coaching years, you're standing on the sidelines a little bit more. We are coaching them while they begin to make some independent decisions. And obviously there's a continuum. There's a kind of a sliding scale of, of letting them make more and more decisions when they're 12. It's going to look a little different than when they're 17. Um, so you have to obviously um, be wise about that. But we're coaching them while they're learning to make some independent decisions. And like a coach, there are times that we yank them off the field. But for the most part, we're standing by and we're letting them make some decisions. We're letting them experience some natural consequences. Rather than manufacturing consequences every time they step out of line, we're letting life kind of deal some consequences because that's how life is, right? You get into the work world, you even get to college. 
life deals pretty brutal circumstances and punishment sometimes. And so if we step back and kind of let those things um, happen the natural way, sometimes that's more effective than taking phones away or taking keys away or, you know, restricting activities or whatever else it is. Um, For parents, this coaching season is the season where we're focused more on connection over correction. So we're still correcting things, obviously, but we're focused more on connecting. And even in the correction aspect of our parenting with our teenage kids, how we ask the question, how do I connect with him? How do I connect with her, even in the midst of this correction that's got to happen? And sometimes that's simply timing or approach, or choice of words, or which parent is more effective with which child to have a hard conversation. One of the things that we learned in our family is that um, Andrew could take correction from either one of us. You know, whichever one of us needed to have a chat with Andrew, it, it was pretty effective from either one of us. For Garrett, it was oddly, if, if it was appropriate, it was oddly me that he responded better to. And part of it was I would scratch his back while I was talking to him and he, I'm, he would tell me everything. As long as I would scratch, he would keep talking. And so, and Andy's not going to scratch his back and talk softly, you know, and all the things like, like I do. And so I, it was very, it was more effective. Andy was so effective with Allie because they're both musical and she had a little keyboard beside her bed and he would play Elton John songs and they would sing Blue Jean Baby together and have a whole thing and, you know, their little thing. And then they would just ease right into this conversation um, with her. So figure, you know, figuring some of those things out in these coaching years, it's just clutch because if you know which one of you is more effective and which approaches are more effective for different personalities of kids, it's amazing that kids who come from the same gene pool can be so different from each other. You've probably experienced that. Um, and so being a student of your kids, even in those training years, but especially in the coaching years, being a student of your kids is so powerful and leveraging Enneagram and leveraging temperament testing and leveraging love languages, all those things that we have now as parents, so great, so great to be on top of some of those things. The rookie mistake in the coaching season is stepping in and resolving or solving your kids' problems. Let them begin figuring out stuff in this season while you are nearby to coach them through it, but don't do it for them. And I was so great at doing everything for everybody. And it just came back to bite me so many times. We had one of our foster daughters, uh, we started fostering when in 2010 and we had foster kids in and out. And um, one of our foster daughters, she was terrible at math. And I mean, I just needed her to make it through geometry. And math is easy for me. And so I would sit down and I would be like, all right, Maisie, I need you to at least watch me while I do your homework, okay? You have to sit here. You cannot look at your phone while I do your homework. And all this was great until test time. Because Maisie could not do, she could not figure out how to, you know, put a theorem together and do the whole thing. And so it it came back to bite us. And anyway, I had to learn my lesson the hard way with that. So anyway, rookie mistake in the season, stepping in, solving things, doing things for your kids that they really need to be doing for themselves because they got one foot out the door when, you know, when they're getting into this season. The faith element of the coaching years, continue modeling what it looks like to follow Jesus. Continue modeling it, even when it's hard. And you know, as parents, there are hard decisions that come your way or things that you would rather do, but the right thing is different than what you'd rather do. Let your kids see you make those hard decisions. Don't make those in a private conversation with your spouse. Have those conversations at the dinner table. Hey, here's an opportunity that has come our way. Here's what I think we should do. Here's what I want to do. Let them see your humanity in all of it. Let them see that and understand that even my parents have to make hard decisions and have to make sacrifices. Your kids seeing you put your faith into practice is huge. Um, Let your church partner with you. This church has an awesome student ministry. Let your, your, your church partner with you. There are things that their small group leader will say to them that they think is brilliant, and you have said it 10,000 times, and it just boom. You know, they never heard it when you said it. But when Jason said it, I mean, I can't tell you how many times our kids would come home and say, Mom, Jason said I should so-and-so and so. And I'm like, "Ah, Jason is so smart. You should totally do that. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh. I mean, how many times have I said that? Um, So partner, let your church partner with you. It is, I mean, it is something that is so important and, and gets you so much further down the road with your kids. 
Um, encourage a mission trip. When your kids are in the, in the, in the season of life, in the coaching season, um, and maybe even in the training season toward the end with you, but let your kids go on a mission trip without you. And I say this because I cannot tell you how many times I have personally seen, Andy and I have seen, and we've, we've seen it in our own lives because we both did mission trips as teenagers, this is where your kids often begin to own their faith for the first time because it's the first time they are in an environment where they are serving because that's what they're there for. Everything else they do at home, I mean, they may go volunteer some hours somewhere, but they are going to great effort. They're having to raise some money. They're having to do the whole thing, and they get to maybe another country or another area of the, of the, of the United States or wherever, and they are there to serve, and they are pouring out their life just like Jesus modeled for us. They are there to serve and not be served, and if you know anything about teenagers, they are pretty set on being served. And so they are stepping out of that. And this is often where they begin to own their faith. It's a powerful thing. Coach your kids to learn to intersect their faith with their decision making in this season of life. And then the friendship years. Friendship years are 18 on and this is where we are with our kids now and and it is it has just it hasn't been seamless. You know, there's just there's no seamless season and it doesn't matter, you know, I mean there's again I mentioned this morning there's so many variables that are outside of our control with our kids that will impact their mental health or their faith or you know so many things we don't have control of. But this is where we are with our kids now, and we're just grateful that they're in healthy places. Um, and in this season of friendship years, especially on the front end of it, there's still some coaching to do. Your kids are in college. They're doing things for the first time. I still get phone calls from Maisie, one of our foster daughters. It's like, hey, do you have my Medicaid number? Because when you're in foster care, it's Amera Group and Medicaid, at least in Georgia. I'm not sure how's it in Alabama. Hey, I mean, you know, so I'm still doing things with Maisie, even though she's now 22 years old. Same with our kids. You know, I don't know how many times I got called for social security numbers or, you know, just questions that they have about how to go to the doctor, what do I give them? You know, just so many things you're coaching them through, even in the friendship years. Um, but this is a season where that becomes a lot less. And again, our kids are in their 20s and 30s. And I told Andy one day, I said, you know what? If we didn't know our kids and we met them, I think we'd want to be friends with them because we just like them. And that to me is the win of the friendship season of life. This is the season where um, we, one of the principles we talk about in the book is later is longer. So sometimes we have to make harder decisions now that are going to serve us better in the future because later is longer. This is the later is longer part. If you look at the continuum of time of your parenting, you've got the discipline years kind of short, got the training years a little bit longer, you got the coaching years, you know, kind of medium, and then the friendship years go on as long as you're living. And so later is longer. So parent toward later rather other than right now. The rookie mistake in the friendship years is offering unsolicited advice. Offering unsolicited advice. This is a season of life where we transition from, hey, here's what I think you ought to do, to, hey, how can I help? How can I help? That becomes our question in the friendship years. I can see that this is a hard season for you. I can see that you're making a tough decision. You're an adult, of course, so I know you're going to make a good decision. Just let me know how I can help. That's how we, what we transition to in the friendship years. Um, there's a guy named Jim Burns who wrote a book. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called Doing Life with Your Adult Children. Has anybody heard it? The subtitle is Keep the Welcome Mat Out and Your Mouth Shut. <laughs> Isn't that a brilliant title? He needs to coach Andy on titles of books, I think. But um, So anyway, Jim Burns. So again, we've been in small group for so long, and we did this book in our small group because all of our kids are kind of after college, getting married, having babies. And we had the best discussions in our group because typically the moms are the ones that have a little harder time dialing it back and not just giving all the unsolicited advice and looking for teachable moments, you know, for everything. Um, and so we just had some really fun and funny um, stories and things that we've all experienced as it relates to parenting adult children. Um, so rookie mistake, offering unsolicited advice. The faith element in this season is it's time to let them just own it. You know, you got to step back, back off, let them figure it out. When they're in college, don't check, you know, find my phone to see if they're at church every Sunday morning. Don't text them and, you know, with the passive aggressive, hey, the sermon at our church was so good this week. How was yours? 
You know, just, you know, passive aggressive. Um, I speak from, from experience on that. Um, so these are the stages of parenting, the, dis the, the discipline years, training years, coaching years, friendship years. And um, these are the stages that we harnessed for choosing specific parenting approaches as our kids progressed. And um, here's something interesting, and especially for the younger parents in the room, your kids will move from one stage to the next, whether you do or not. So don't get stuck in one season when they've moved on to the other. You will make some terrible fatal parenting flaws and bad decisions. Um, your parenting will be so much more effective if you move along with them. So for relationship-oriented parenting, it will be richer, deeper, and better if you can kind of get your head around the idea of parenting relationally within the structure of these um, stages of parenting. So I will turn it back over to Carter, or we'll do some, we're going to do some Q&A first now. All right, let's do that. Sandra. Don't ask me anything hard. I'm not going to ask you anything hard. You're, <laughs> you have this demeanor that's like we were doing the mic check and they were asking you, you're going to get louder and you're like, no, this is just my thing. Yeah. So you have this like soft demeanor, but that was like drinking from a parenting wisdom fire hose, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, that was so good. Um, I sent you some questions. I'm going to ask yeah. you one that's not, that I didn't send. So, okay. oh, because no. you made me think of something. Okay. Because you talked about resources of, you know, like Enneagram stuff. So one of the things yeah. for, for me that I read probably about two, two and a half years ago, I read Ian Morgan Cron's oh, yeah. Road, Road Back yes. to You. It's the Enneagram book. And I, real, I read the book, and younger children, their personalities aren't quite right. developed. So yeah. it's harder. But I could read the book, and I could place Morgan and Tanner, my two oldest. Yeah. I would, and it was finally like I read... Enneagram 8, which I am, and I'm like, oh, and eight, eights want to be in charge. Oh, yeah. They hold the yeah, flag. They're that's the right. leader. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's why we want to kill each other sometimes mm -hmm. because he's an <laughs> eight too, mm -hmm. and I am in charge. I'm yeah. the dad, or at least I pretend to be, and he wants to be. Mm -hmm. So it was, and, and Tanner, who does not have that personality, and I'm like, oh, well, that's why I struggle with that. So yeah. I just wanted to ask... Yeah. Are, were, are there a couple other just books, resources that like were yeah. impactful for you? I saw yes. so many people taking notes that, you, that they might, because I know they're all going to read Parenting, yeah. Getting It of Right, course. best of title book they ever. Are. But how, what other books or resources have been you impactful? You know what, and really as it relates to all of this, I, um, you know the DISC task, the four quadrants of, per, of uh, it's, it's not personality, it's, di um, uh, what's it called? Um, not personality testing because that's Enneagram. Strength. But so no, not it's not, I'll think of it in a second. Um, but there's a book called I Said This, You Heard That. And it's about the disc and it's in colors. So the so the D yeah. on the on that quadrant is red. And then yellow is like the love to be up front, love lots of friends, social person. So it's red and then it's yellow. And then the green is the little bit more laid back, the server, it's the S on the disc. And then the blue is the, is the, um, the blue is the C. You know, got to have all the information, like all of our ducks in a row, you know, just have all the things. I am telling you, that is the greatest book. And the test is in the book. It's sort of a magazine size paperback book. Get it on Amazon or whatever. But the test is in there and you take the test and figure out what your temper temperament, that's yeah. the word I was looking for, figure out what your temperament is. And, there, and then they came out, the author's name is Kathleen Edelman, and then they launched a, um, I said this, you heard that, for kids. So it helps you identify your children's temperaments. And, she and you can follow them on Instagram too. I said this, you heard that, it's great. And they talk about if you have a red child, the, the kind of the trigger words, words that you use, words that you don't use, um, approaches to discipline, some different things for each, of the, each one of them. Well, Andy and I are both Enneagram 1 which, you know, we just, our house doesn't look like anybody lives in it. You know, it's just, we just like everything yes, orderly. Yeah, and, and it was not good. It goes to one of the questions you're going to ask me in, the, in a minute about regrets. But anyway, um, so 
Andy and our Enneagram ones, we're both kind of, we both have a lot of blue and we like, you know, we like all the information before we make a decision. We, you know, like to have everything in order. I'm a little bit red, so I want to kind of lead. He has to be a leader in his job, right. um, but he's more blue. And then, so, but Garrett, our middle one, we learned much later after parenting years were over that he's yellow, which is diagonal on the quadrant, which means kind of opposite personality. So here's poor yellow Garrett who just wants to have a good time everywhere he goes. And he's got two blue parents going, Shh, stop, why'd you do that? Don't do that. Fix that. Pick that up. Stop. You know, so, so later, so Garrett's an adult and, um, and we figure all this out. And the very first time we did this material, it was for continuing ed for foster care because you have to have 15 hours a year to be foster parents. And we were like, oh my goodness, I think Garrett's yellow. So we went to Garrett and we were like, Garrett, we are so sorry that we parented you. You're yellow and we're blue and we were just always trying to calm you down and all that. So through the last few years, we've apologized to him multiple times about, you know, parenting him the way that we did in some ways. And um, finally one day he said, can y'all just stop? Because I'm yellow. I also know some yellows who are obnoxious. So if you toned that down in me, thank you. Yeah. So we're like, oh, <laughs> okay, well, out. I guess that's perspective. It that's a good out. perspective on that's it. But yes, good. that's a great resource that's for parents. Good. And um, just in general, work environments. It's yeah. kind of become language in our organization. Like, yeah. okay, in this job, we probably need somebody that tends a little blue. Or, you know, we need a stage person. We're going to look for a yellow on the temperament test. Yeah, so, that's yeah. good. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, Power of Moments is one a book that, that impacted my parenting. Oh. I don't know if you've read that. Chip and so. Dan Heath. Okay, I know um, those names. It, it changed the way I thought about how children remember, remember things and how I want to shape that. One of the stories they tell in there is like Disney World about, I mean, Disney World is, uh, let, let me finish this before you judge what I'm going to say. It's mostly awful. <laughs> Sticky it's and hot. germs together. It's hot. I love it. You spend <laughs> bukus of money. You spend most of your time waiting in line. Yeah. And you bring a seven, eight-year-old home on the way home, and they're like, that was awesome. Because <laughs> all they remember is moments. All they remember is the Dole Whip. All they remember is the ride. All they remember mm. is the laughter. And it was moments when like 78% of the trip was waiting in line and hot and whining. But, and so how can we sh kind of shape that? And so we've tried, I've tried to think about how, when there are big decisions, big yeah. conversations, big moments to create something, to create a moment around there to make that a positive experience. Mm, so, awesome. okay. I sent some questions to you. I'm going to ask this. What are one or two things you talked about those four stages? I think those are brilliant. Are there any things you wish you could go back and tell Sandra and Andy in those stages. <laughs> well, that goes back to the kind of the Enneagram one thing. We just, you know, we were always picking up, making our kids clean up, which, you know, obviously that's important to some degree. Um, but I have the funniest story. Well, I'll back up. I love efficiency. I think efficiency is just, I, I just, I, I've Eng never met a system. Background. Yeah, yeah, I've never met a system I couldn't make more efficient. You know, <laughs> I mean, I know how to input a new variable and see how it affects it. And, you know, I just I know how to do all the things. I love efficiency. And uh, say it's my love language. I, it's not on the list, but it still kind of. <laughs> kind of is. But what I learned in parenting is efficiency is not the goal. Connection is the goal. And in parenting, efficiency can really get in the way mm. of relating and connecting with our kids. And so that was something that I just had to constantly learn how to dial back yeah. and be in the moment with my kids, be on the floor playing with my kids. I had to make myself do some of that because I just, it's not efficient. It's not efficient yeah. use of my time to play. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, there's just, so that was just hard for me in my personality, but I have a really funny story of something that happened. So we had three sisters as foster kids and the youngest one was five and she didn't talk and just trauma, different things that had happened. She just didn't talk. And so if we ask a question, she would whisper to her sisters and then they would have to answer the question. So her name is McKaylee. She's now 19 and we're still in relationship with all three of them. Maisie, the one that I mentioned is the middle one of those three. And um, so anyway, so McKaylee turned five while we, while they were, when they first came to live with us and somebody gave her some roller skates for her, for her birthday. And so we've got hardwood floors, you know, all over our house and the roller skates hadn't been outside on the concrete yet. So they were smooth. And I thought, you know what, I think I could let her roller skate here in the house and not, you know, have to go outside where it's hot and nobody wants to be out there. And then she can roller skate. So she can roller skate around the house. Well, Andrew, our oldest comes home from college 
And he walks in and McKaylee's roller skating all over the house and he's like, what is happening? <laughs> What is happening? Where are my Enneagram One y'all parents? Would, y'all wouldn't even let us run in the house. And she's skating in the house. So all that to say, if I were going back and saying something to Andy and Sandra and a younger version of us, I would say, just chill a little. Yeah. You know, just enjoy your kids. This thing flies by. That's I right. know older people are always telling younger parents, this just goes by so fast. And you're like, not fast enough, you know, in certain seasons. But it does. It goes by so fast, as you yeah. know. And so just dial it back a little bit on the efficiency and the organization and everything having to be perfect yeah. and just enjoy your kids. That's very good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now that you have adult children, so you're, you've, you're in stage four, is there something that like surprised you at any of the stages that you're like, oh, I didn't, because I mean, I, that's the thing is you've, if you've never been in that stage You've never, you've never been a parent of like, right. so, so, so right. now we're, in, we're entering the, co- the, <laughs> uh, the friendship stage. So yeah. it's like, oh, now I'm learning things. So were there things that surprised you as you got to those stages? You know, one of the things we mentioned earlier, you know, how surprising it is that kids can be so different from each other in the same environment, the same, you know, gene pool, maybe, you know, just all the things, how different they can be. One of the things that was surprising to me was how different they approached kind of puberty, you know, kind of hitting 13, 12, 13, just their responses to that. Andrew went to his room for three years. I mean, he just, you know, he just got quiet and just went to his room. And I'm like, what happened to my son? And Andy said, this is normal. It's, it's perfectly normal. But then he backtracked over to Andy and said, hey, I mean, to Andrew and said, hey, when you come in from school, you know, just like at least grunt toward your mom yeah, because she birthed you and all, and yeah. she really wants to have <laughs> something from you. So before you go out to your room, just give her a little bit of attention. So, you know, Andy kind of coached him through that. That was, that was Andrew. Mm-hmm. Garrett's manifested in rage. Like there was stuff in here that had to come out. And so there were times I would just look at him and say, Gary, I need you to go to your room and scream into your pillow as loud as you can three times, then come downstairs and we'll talk. And he, you know, so he would go upstairs and I'd hear this muffled, you know, it just, he just, it had to be, the pressure had to be let off yeah. in him. And so yep. we would scream into pillows. Um, for Allie, it was, as you might imagine, it was tears. It was like, Allie, why are you crying? I don't know. I don't know why I'm crying. You know, so with her, it was just completely different. But so, to you know, that, that was surprising to me. I just kind of thought, I don't know what I thought. I don't even know that I was expecting anything, but there's something that comes when yeah. they turn 13, and you just need to be able to recognize it. I did say to Allie ahead of time, I said, Allie, you know, there's going to come a time when you're going to feel all kinds of emotions and kind of stuff, and you're not even going to know what they are. You might cry without even knowing what you're crying about. And I tried to kind of prepare her ahead of time, yeah. and I remember one of the times it happened, I said, oh, Allie, what's the matter? She said, I think this is that thing you told me. It's not happening. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, so at least she kind of knew, you know, this is going to be a yeah. thing. But yeah, I think just the differences between kids that are raised in the same environment is just amazing. Yes. Teenage boys, we resonate with those first two. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. could you let us know you made it home yeah. and... Yeah. yeah. Grunt my way Since we something. paid for the food, you went and started <laughs> eating right. and, you know, yeah. the whole deal. Yeah. Um, you talked about, I love the rookie mistakes. I don't love them, but like, I love that yeah. you shared those. Are there any things that, and so you're North Point, you got a ton of young families coming through there. Are there, are there things you see kind of common mistakes young parents are making? Not, not to be judgmental, but that's yeah. just like, man, if I could coach them, mm-hmm. I'm just seeing this thing a lot. Yeah. Um, I think probably two things. One thing is, I think the helicopter parent thing is worse than it's ever been before. Yeah. Um, and pr- part of it is you just have access to information. I mean, one of, one of my daughters-in-law has a puppy that goes to daycare and she can watch the puppy, you know, from her phone. I thought, oh, this is going to be tricky when we have children. Yeah. You know, if we're watching now that things are going at the dog place, this is going to be, this is going to be interesting. Um, but I think, I think the helicopter thing is something that I'm seeing where people just, you know, parents, young parents need to realize how to kind of step back from that and, yeah. and find a healthy balance there. I think the other thing, I think um, it's intuitive 
when we have maybe a second child or a third child to look at the calendar and to start shaving things off the calendar, and we should, because obviously we want to focus on the things that are most important, and every season of life looks different. There are certain things in different seasons of life that I said no to. I, in yeah. my heavy-duty parenting years, we called, I called them a categorical no's. There were just certain things like this, like speaking, right. opportunities and stuff that during that season, I just automatically <clears throat> said no to, yeah. because in order to do what I wanted to do well, which was parenting, I was going to have to shave off some other stuff. But I think to answer your question, um, parents are quick to shave off things like community group. And I think staying in community with other parents in your same season, doing life with them and parenting with them and, you know, accountability and care and all the things that come with small groups is so important. So if you have to give up something, give up something else, but hang on to that. Yeah, that's so good. Um, yeah, that, that's so good. We, we, we just, we want to have that, that helicopter parent thing, and now it's so much easier with technology oh, to is. just sort yeah. of, and it feels like control, even if it's not control. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I know one of the things, I've, I've heard Craig Groeschel talk about this, and I know Craig and Amy, I know you and Andy mm-hmm. know them, Craig's at Life Church, is he talks about really, that they, and I try to do this, I have a big wall calendar in my office to put, hey, these are, these are the things that we're going to do, the, the big rocks of our yearly yeah. calendar. This is when we're going to the beach, and this is when we're going, and, and all that. And what I'm finding is Emily and I have found this recently as our boys are dating, mm-hmm. and now they, and they have friends and cars, and they get around, is that we almost have to do that for a week. Yeah. Because we'll be like, all right, you know, we got dinner coming up. Oh, well, I was going out with so-and-so, mm-hmm. or I was going out with some friends, and I'm like, we cooked tonight. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this was not going to be a Chick-fil-A night. We yeah. cooked. Yeah, we have, like, real and food. And it's like, we, we have real food. <laughs> and because we had yeah. time, right? Yeah. And it's like, we almost need to do that. Just say, hey, Friday night yeah. is going to be a family dinner, right? And if you got friends that want to be here, let us know. We'll make sure there's enough food. Right. Or, hey, that just needs to be just the family. Like, we almost have to block that out. I'm so glad you before. said that. I think family dinner, dinner around the table at home, doesn't really matter what you're eating. Dinner around the table at home is just a non negotiable. Certainly as they get older and have lives of their own, um, it's going to be less and less. But at the beginning of weeks yeah. of, of the week, often I would do in our family text, I'd say, hey, we're going to have dinner on Tuesday night and Thursday night this week as a family. So yeah. we can do it early, we can do it late, but we're going to all do it, be, it, be together. So if you've got somewhere you need to be, let's schedule around it. Um, and I would try to be um, thoughtful toward their schedules and considerate of their, you know, things they wanted to do. But, you know, just having two nights, these are non-negotiables, two nights or three nights, if you can, um, where these are non-negotiables. Dinner time is so important. Yeah. Dinner time is where so much of life happens, where yeah. you have those hard conversations or conversations of things that you're trying to get your kids to see or understand or just general stuff. So much happens around the dinner table. That's it's right. so important. Yeah. That's good. Uh, okay, last question before we get to your question. So if you've got questions you want to ask Sandra or, or some of our staff team, be writing them down, uh, and, we will, and we'll hand those in. So you and Andy, you're right on the tail end, but you've you got to raise kids, certainly young kids and almost teenagers, before the digital boom. Yes. You, you know, really before. But now, I mean, anybody that's a parent in this room with kids, Mm -hmm. they're raising kids in this digital world that's so different than the one I grew up in. My parents have zero experience in it. Um, How how do you suppose, have you and Andy talked about what what would you do if you're now you had a 10 year old in this world? You know, our kids, when they were in high school, you know, the iPhones were already here, that kind of stuff. So we were dealing with it a little, but, uh, but nothing like what people are having to navigate now. And it's younger and younger and younger when their brains are just not even developed and they're being faced with social media stuff and all that. It's just taking a, a toll on mental health, I think, as a, as a whole in our, in our culture and in our, in the climate of where we're living. But, um, I think one thing is that technology, for those of you who have younger kids, it has to be a constant conversation within your family. And by constant, I don't mean nagging and one-sided. I mean two-sided conversations where you're talking with your kids. And I just wrote down a couple of things. Um, 
one of the things, and I, I love that your church has adopted the idea of four, of being mm -hmm. for your community and all that. I think the word for is so important in our parenting. When our kids can understand that our rules are not arbitrary, our rules are for a reason because we are for them. Um, Allie, I am for you getting to the end of your middle school or high school years with as few regrets as possible. I am so for you, and that's why we're dialing back this you know, phone time or screen yeah. time, or that's why we're taking up the phones at night when everybody goes to bed and it's staying in mom and dad's room until the morning. You know, having some things like that, but communicating it in a way that your kids understand this isn't because mom and dad don't want me talking to my friends. You know, I mean, they, they can construct all kinds of motives for you, but if you let them know ahead of time, our motive behind this is we are for you. We are for your relationship with your Heavenly Father. We are for your academics. We are for your brain development. We are for your mental health. We are so for you. And so we're dialing this back. Um, and letting your kids know, I see this potential thing as, as hurting you. I can see this phone or this computer or just complete leeway to see whatever sites you want to look at. All of this is destructive and I see it hurting you. And I am so for you. I'm not going to let anything hurt you. So say yeah. what you want. My motivation is I am for you. And that's why we're dialing this back. Yeah. I don't know any other way to do it other yeah. than also in addition, being up on, to, on technology yourself. And I know that's a lofty thing to take on, but you need to either understand what your kids are looking at or be very close to someone who can help you understand what they're looking at and what they're doing online yeah. and with gaming and all the different things. Yeah. Um, take the time that it takes to understand what's going on um, is important. Yeah. It's a challenge. Well, uh, I want to thank you so much. That was so good. I want to welcome up uh, Jake Davis, Melissa Sanderson, Karen Hoare, and Chris Connor to come up on stage, all part of our staff team. And they have kids, um, and, and Sandra, you'll stick around with us, that are of different ages, uh, some teenagers. Chris has got some, some guys really in the thick of those elementary, middle school years. Jake is living in toddler world and has an adopted yeah. one, of his, one yeah. of his three kids. He has a brand new baby, like brand spanking new, like how many months? Are y'all going to be behind four us? Four weeks. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to go sit up there. Okay, let's do that. Um, and uh, and <laughs> also has an adopted daughter. So I think I'm supposed to be beside Melissa. You're supposed okay. to be on the end. That's, right. I'm just doing what I was told. Okay. I'm, I'm getting bit directed. I got to so, obey the rules. I'm a rule follower. Do we have uh, some questions that will come in? I don't know if uh, Glenn or Emily might could help uh, gather, gather up questions. If you have a question, if not, we'll just take some. that have, they'll, they'll come get them. We got some over here. Somebody over here. Help. There we go. We got some questions. Uh, and while we're taking up questions, why don't you guys introduce yourself, what your role is at the church, and can, maybe the, and about just your family, real quick, ages and, and Yeah, and um, my name is Chris Connor. I am the missions and outreach guy here, previously in student ministry. Uh, I have a seven, nine, and, or seven, nine, and 12-year-old uh, sons, so that usually gets a response. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're in the throes of trying to figure out the birth order dynamic. Mm -hmm. Puberty um, and all that fun stuff. Yeah. I'm Karen Hoare. I'm the nursery preschool director with Kids Ministry on staff here. And we have four kids. We've got um, three girls and a boy. I have to go top, bottom. Um, we're at 17, 16, 15, and 13. Oh, wow. So we're in the teen years. <laughs> Figure that out with three girls in the house in a teen <laughs> world. Nice. Fun. <clears throat> I'm Jake Davis. Uh, I'm the creative and digital pastor here at Mountaintop. Um, my wife, Hayla, and I have three children. Um, Ayla, our adopted daughter, is about to turn five. Uh, Campbell, our son, is uh, three. And then we have a four-week-old, Liam. Uh, Melissa Sanderson. I'm the kids ministry pastor here. And we have Yeah, and of course you guys know I'm Carter, Emily, and I have four boys, Morgan, Tanner, Walker, and Brooks. They're 19, 17, 15, and 13. We just got back from a nine-day, 2,000-mile road trip and lived to tell about it. 
I thought about last night just asking the guys, like, hey, do we all want to sleep in the same room again yeah. since we've been doing it for night? <laughs> Nobody really wanted to do that. No. They wanted to go to their own rooms. That's so, great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then our kids are 31, 29, and 27. Yeah. So. And the grand, yeah. grandbaby is And seven, Haven eight is almost eight months. And you have one on the way. I have one coming in January. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so here's some questions. My three-year-old daughter is mischievous and lies. How do you discipline for dishonesty? Um, uh, currently, she doesn't get in trouble just so I can get her to tell the truth. Um, yeah, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you discipline for that kind of dishonesty? Um, any thoughts? I feel like you're looking at me because that's my my realm here at church. Yeah, I, yeah. Karen, <laughs> Karen leads in our there. preschool and I babies. Will tell you, and... I've had a couple parents actually bring that up to me uh, within yeah. this past year, and that is an issue. In in as Sandra spoke, I wonder sometimes if it is the culture and times we live in, and so much intake. Uh, they are sponges just developmentally as creatures and human beings. And then you add in the technology that's in front of them all the time. Um, and so we have kids that are continually stimulated. Um, so whether that contributes to them wanting to um, portray a life that maybe is a little more out here in the world, like um, make believe, that so they make up stuff. I don't want to say they're lying, lying. Um, but when we're dealing with kids who, who struggle with being more still, being more truthful, um, being honest, um, respectful, as Sandra brought up a lot today. Um, I would go back to what I tend to tell parents and I, I believe brought up today too is training, 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 mm -hmm. consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, you might laugh, but I often, this is gonna sound terrible, just hear me out, like Carter says. I, I, I related to training an, a dog. We've always had dogs in our homes, and honestly, I mean, a dog is like a two-year-old vocabulary if you look up like dog stuff, right? And kids are about the same way. When you're at that age, it's the same thing. It is just consistency, consistency, um, training. We did timeouts when they were those ages. Sometimes it worked. My kids, even as they got older, like, ooh, that was the timeout chair. Like, they remembered. I was surprised they remembered those things. Um, but I would say consistency and love and, and just know that that training hopefully will, will pay off in the long mm -hmm. run. And as she mentioned earlier, the season will change and what that looks like mm -hmm. in that training when you're dealing with lying or, um, you know, just not being truthful. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Uh, so... You, your parenting style and approach to it might have to change too. Yeah, that's yeah. good. You, that's good. Now I know from listening to Andy over the years yeah. and in the book, <laughs> the a big, big rule, rule in the Stanley yeah. House was don't lie. Yeah, and one of the things that we said to our kids from an early age is lying breaks a relationship. Right? Lying breaks a relationship. That's why it's a rule in our house not to lie because lying breaks a relationship. And in each different season, you know, it's going to look different. But one of the things that we did, we did discipline for lying, um, even though that feels like maybe it's going to set them up to want to lie more so that they don't get in trouble. I think that might be counterintuitive. So one of the things that we would say to our kids occasionally, if we needed to confront them of something and we felt like they were going to be tempted to lie, we would say, depending on their age, you know, as to how we would say it, but we would look them in the eye and we'd say, I need to ask you a question and you're going to be tempted to lie to me, but I want you to tell me the truth. And, you know, you might be in trouble, but you might be, you'll be in more trouble if you lie. But we would give them, because a lot of times kids lie because they're caught and it's just their, their impulse is to lie, to not be in trouble. So if you take a moment and you say, you know what, I'm going to ask you a question, and I know you're going to be tempted to lie, but remember, lying breaks our relationship. Telling the truth is so important. I need you to tell me the truth. And that allows them to take a breath for a second and then maybe be a little more willing to be forthcoming with what the truth is. So yeah. giving them a minute. Because, again, lying often, I mean, when you are tempted to lie, it's because you're caught off guard 
right? Yeah. And so when our kids are caught off guard, they're going to be tempted to lie. So just take a step back. Hey, I know you're going to be tempted to lie to mommy. Or hey, I know you're going to be tempted to lie to me. I mean, you know, depending on their age, your tone of voice and everything. But that was just a way that we made it sound really important. And we love you so much. We don't want our relationship to be broken. And lying is really hard to have a relationship with somebody who lies. That's right. Yeah. That's good. Anybody can want I add, add one it? thing to that? This is so perfect. And uh, one of the best things that you can learn with dealing with young ones and parenting is getting on their level. Mm -hmm. So when you say something like that, it's, it's instead of having that stature way up here to someone down here, it's coming down to mm -hmm. them. And, and sometimes they'll take that moment with you yeah. and understand and say, okay, and yeah. give you the truth. A calm demeanor goes a long way. If you're, if you're asking them a question while you're angry, that's on you. So you need to kind of step back and take some deep breaths and have the conversation a little bit later. Yeah, I'll say, so we have, our, our middle child is, um, he's great. Um, he, he's wild, and, and he struggles with dishonesty. Uh, he, he often says things like, um, uh, if we tell him that we know that he did something, he said, but you didn't see me do it. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> he's smart. Regardless of you whether I saw you do it, I, I yeah. know you did it. Um, so he, we have some dishonesty issues with our yeah. little boy. One of the things that we've tried to be super intentional about is uh, we, we do discipline um, for dishonesty, but we, we try to um, reward when we see honesty. Mm -hmm. so, um, so good. Because we have found with him that he really needs positive reinforcement. And if we're constantly badgering him about uh, his dishonesty, um, then he's going he's gonna to go into a shell and want to mm -hmm. hide more. Because often it's just to kind of avoid punishment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so when we see honesty, we try to, every time, we try to make sure that we're calling it out and intentional about it. So proud of you, buddy, for being honest about that. Um, and, and then if, he, if he's honest about something that he did that was wrong, then we, 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 we either don't punish or we, we bring the punishment back a few steps mm -hmm. so that he understands that he's being rewarded for his right. honesty so that he can, he can feel like he's safe, right? He's in a place that he can trust that we love him and we care for him and he can, he can be forthright, forthright with us. Good. Um, next question is, what can I do at home to help a five-year-old who wants to do the complete opposite of what I ask? If they are told to do something they do not want to do, it starts a tantrum. My five-year-olds never did that, so. <laughs> I, I'll start out and say some things. I mean, every kid's different, so, I mean, I... Like Sandra said today, I mean, I think all of us, we know there are biblical principles, but they're just things we do, and none of us are perfect. Um, my advice to parents, and one of the things that we did, and this was based off, Emma and I were very aligned in this, and we had the, Sandra talks about being in ministry, and how, to this morning, how, you know, the great thing in ministry is you're around families a lot. So you get to see families who do it right. And you're like, ooh, they have great teenagers. They have great college. And then you all get, so get to see some families like, don't ever do anything those parents do because their teenagers are terrible and they're, or their toddlers. <laughs> so, I mean, like, you just get to watch a lot of families in ministry. So we got to watch families. Um, <clears throat> I just think you need to be really mean when they're little. And you need to get over that they don't like you. They are going to have thousands of friends. They get one set of parents. They get one set of parents. And I can remember Morgan McInnes walking upstairs at five years old, turning around on the stairs, looking at me and screaming at the top of his lungs, I hate you. And going and getting a piece of notebook paper and writing, I hate my daddy, I hate my daddy. Because I was in charge and I was not arguing with the kid and he was going to do what I said because I am the dad in the house and there is no discussion. Mm -hmm. And man, like a gentleman at 19, he came over there today and looked Sandra Stanley in the eye and introduced himself and he's so polite as a 19 year old. Mm -hmm. And he does not remember that. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. But he knows how to act because he was taught at a very young age. I just always just said this. I don't argue with children. I wouldn't argue with your children. I'm not arguing with my children. I'm the adult. Your mother is the adult. We're, this is not an argument. We are in charge. 
Like when you are 30, we'll have conversations, but not when you're three. <laughs> and so yeah. I, I just see this, and I've been doing ministry for 23 years, and I mean, we didn't always get it right. We had so many times we, we didn't, and I probably, you know, went a little too heavy sometimes. I was like, that was, that was a little too mean. I shouldn't have done that. But I'm just really grateful now. Um, and so, but th- that's, if you, I ask you the mistakes, the mistakes I see young parents is that, that they just want their toddlers to like them. Mm-hmm. And you're just, you don't need your toddlers to like you. They're not even going to remember being toddlers. But if they will not like you and they'll learn to respect yeah. you, probably when they're 13, 14, 15, 16, you'll start right. a, a budding friendship. And that's why those are the discipline they're years. They're discipline They years. really they're are. Discipline. And your goal, you know, you're tight. You're, uh, the goal is to loosen up as you move on the continuum of time with your kids. So, you know, tighter is better early, yeah. to your point, you know, really disciplining quickly, being consistent. And then as you move along the continuum, you can loosen up and loosen up, and then you're at the friendship years. But if you make the mistake of trying to be friends in any of the other seasons, it's, it's going to end up hurting rather than helping. Yeah. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say about, oh, uh, um, for whoever asked that question, I, I would imagine that your kid is probably read on the temperament testing. Mm-hmm. And I would really recommend the book I mentioned by Kathleen Edelman because she gives some very practical ways to address things based on the temperament of your child. And so, you know, if you're battling for control with a five-year-old, they're probably red. My sister has the reddest child I've ever seen. He's a wonderful adult now, but she says when he was born, he was born standing up and mad that he was a baby. (laughs) And and she's not wrong. My, my, my parents were keeping, his name is Walker. My parents were keeping Walker one weekend and my sister called to check and said, how's my little angel doing? And my dad, who's a Marine, said, there are no angels here. There is a colonel, but there, there's a colonel here. There's not an angel here. So that's, that was Walker. And they were appropriately t- hard during those earlier yeah. years, and he's a fabulous adult who knows how to leverage his leadership in a, in a healthy way. Um, so I would say, um, you know, lean into that temperament stuff because she has some great tools for, for figuring out the right words to use, the right approaches to use for different temperaments of kids. Yeah. Before you move on, I, I, there's a quote that I always have in my head over and over again when I think about my sons, especially my middle one, who his name's Aiden, which means ball of fire or a little fire, which he's lived up to that name his whole life. Uh, but there's a great movie called Remember the Titans where uh, the two guys, Julius and Gary, are talking. He says, attitude reflects leadership. And I've, I've learned and I've had to control myself. I've had to realize that my kid's response is a lot like me. Mm. I have to keep my composure because he is learning from me. They are learning from me. And so if they're throwing tantrums, I may not throw a tantrum, but my response to his tantrum feeds his next moment. And so continually finding myself, to I need need to breathe a second. Even though I really want to yell right now, I really want to come down pretty hard thinking that's what's going to get through to him. You've got to find a moment to to be strong, but not out of control. Uh, and so they will eventually reflect what you do. Yeah. And so, no. That's good. That's right. Um, Emily was a tough little mama when they were little. She was a tough little mama. So, um, but I, I would just say, and to your point on temperament, um, there, and, and you just talked about, you know, it's your middle one. They're just, they're not all the same. So, and they won't, they won't throw tantrums. Mm-hmm. When they're 15, uh, uh, in the middle of the you know Walmart floor, if they do, hopefully, it's gonna be really hopefully. ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah. All right, um, Jake. What do you do when your toddler doubles down on telling you no? You got toddlers. You toddlers. You gonna have another one soon? <laughs> Is that what happens? <laughs> Yeah, they huh? keep growing up. What do you? What they? Yeah. What do you do when your toddler doubles doubles down mm-hmm. on telling you no? Cry in a corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on it depends on which one of my kids, mm-hmm. and it depends on the scenario. So I my, our, our adopted daughter struggles a lot with um, uh, separation anxiety, um, and which means that we really struggle with sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And that's probably the, she, most of the time, she's, she's very compliant. Uh, bedtime is very hard because she knows that that means that she's gonna have to be alone for a long time. Um, and so that's the time where we get the most no's. Um, and so uh, what we've had to, to learn with Ayla, particularly, is um, when she gets in that kind of a situation, uh, efficiency goes out the window for us. Um, I think, uh, you know, we have had to adjust our lives to figure out what it looks like for us to create a boundary with her um, and not let her take advantage of us, um, but us still meet her where she's at, what's going on in her brain as a little four-year-old, um, and the fear, the real fear that is there for her. And so I think knowing your children will help you understand their no's. And if you don't know your children, then you don't know why they're saying no to you. And so I would, th I would say that responding to your kids' no's starts with a knowledge of who they are and why they want to, want to behave that way and why they're pushing back on you. That's been really key for us with Ayla. Yeah. Now, Campbell, come back to me in a few years when we figure out how to, how to deal with yeah. him when he says no, because yeah. I still haven't, still haven't cracked that nut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really important because um, for those of us who are a little more red, we tend to just want to win, right? So our kid says no, and it's like, no, let me show you no. I mean, you know, there's, instead of it being a battle of who's going to win, digging down to figure out where is this coming from? And are there some circumstances that have happened during this day or during this past week that is feeding this? Let's, let's see how we can deal with a deeper issue. Um, my tendency is just to say, you know what, I, you said no, I say yes. I win. I'm the mom. Yeah. And there's a time for that. Yeah. But, but I think when, and especially with kids who maybe come out of trauma, um, you know, you, or, or if your kid has been through something hard, you really do have to, um, dig down a little deeper and figure out what the root causes and issues are. Yeah. And it, I think it also depends on what no is. I mean, our kids, when our kids were tired. toddlers, yeah. we, we were just big on our, in our house when our kids were little, like you were going to, and Emily and I do not have exotic food taste. So, I mean, we cook pretty, you know, we cook pretty redneck. I mean, it's pretty Southern. Um, and we do not have exotic food taste. So, we put pretty plain stuff on the table. And we set a rule early on, you eat what we put on the table. We're not making chicken nuggets. We're not making, we do mm -hmm. not make, we don't make Brussels sprouts. We don't so have a like, menu. Like the worst thing, the, like <laughs> green choices. beans is like as bad as it gets in our house. Like, so... We're not making. If you don't want to eat it, you don't have to eat it. And there were just times, many times as a toddler, they're like, "I don't want that. I don't want green beans and grilled chicken." I was like, "Well, like, you don't have to eat it, mm -hmm. but like this is dinner. This is what's for dinner." <laughs> and they were like, "Okay, I'll just not eat." And then they come back and they're like, oh, "Well, I'm hungry." I'm like, "What's Here's absolutely? Your green beans. <laughs> I, let's warm up these green beans and chicken." <laughs> And that, and that was yeah. it. And then a couple times they had them for breakfast. I mean, that was just, and they lived to tell about it. So sometimes that's just one of those, you just got to be a parent and yeah. just like, that's worth, that's right. That's worth winning. But are the, is there something else deeper that you're mm -hmm. talking about? Yeah. And the deeper thing might be your green beans are bad. So, Could be. you know, <laughs> take a poll, take a poll something, around the table. <laughs> something we never consider. Uh, yeah. What now? When now our boys have more exotic taste than we do. We got two that like sushi, and we're like, okay, um, that's just not our deal. Um, what do you do if you feel like you missed the mark on one of these stages and are playing catch up? Mm. Melissa, you want to share anything? What do you do if you feel like you missed the mark? You minister to so many of our families, yeah. and I know you talk to a lot of parents. Yeah, I mean, even reading the book, I was like, man, I could have done that whole uh, training stage. I'm like, oh, I could have trained a little bit more on some on some things. Um, I think you just got to pick up where you are. Um, I think for for me, what I'm learning, and this has kind of been just echoed up here, but just we got to connect with our kids. I mean, if there's anything that I could say over and over again, you've just got to connect where they are and try to pick up the pieces the best you can. Um, but for me, it's just figuring out um, where each of my kids are and um, trying to help them get to that, that next place. Um, but yeah, I can connect well with my oldest. She, she'll sit there and she'll talk to me for hours. My my son, I've had to figure out how do I connect with him so he can share with me? How do I 
do some of the training I missed by getting him alone and spending time with him and figuring out what is he like, what, you know, may not be something that I enjoy, but how do I get out there and learn to throw the baseball with him so that maybe I have an opportunity to train him or something, um, yeah, that maybe I missed along the way, but just here you are, you know, flush that. It's kind of what they say in baseball, flush that time and just be intentional now where you are. I think so too. And I think that there's a lot of grace in parenting. There's a lot of room for getting it wrong. And I think being prayerful that God would meet our kids with what they need, even if we miss some big pieces of it, that he, you know, just beseeching him on your knees to say, God, I missed, you know, I missed this whole chunk of training years, or we didn't discipline when they were little and now we're reaping, you know, reaping some, some not so great um, results from that. Um, I think, I think, leaning into where you are. You don't go back. That's the thing not to do. If you're in the training years, you don't go back to the discipline years because that's not where your kids are. You have to start where your kids are. And I think a lot of times an apology is a good thing from a parent to look at your kids, especially if they're a little bit older and say, hey, I realize that I missed the mark on a few things when you were younger, and I just want to ask you to forgive me. I'm, you know, I, I here's where I missed it. I want to get this right. I'm going to continue to not be a perfect parent because I'm not God. But, you know, just go into your kids with a, a humble spirit, with humility, and saying, man, I, I kind of missed it here, but we're going to pick it up from here, and this is how we're going to do it going forward. And here's some things I'm going to expect of you. Here's some things that your dad and I or your mom and I are going to expect from you as it relates to the, you know, the right way to live our lives and the right way to prioritize things. So I think, you know, you're, you are where you are on the continuum. You have to parent to that child, but you can swing back and have some conversations that pick up some things from before. Yeah, that's very good. Um, this one says, you know, sometimes it's easier to do stuff, to do, to do it myself. Where should you stick to your guns? Uh, I guess in parenting when maybe it's time for them to do something or maybe stick to your guns in parenting, I guess, when you say yes or when you've asked them to do something. I mean, sometimes I look at the room after they've cleaned it. (laughs) Cleaned it. I'm like, I think I could have done that better. But Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, how do you let them do that? I think you got to answer the question, how long do you want to keep doing that task? Mm, That's good. That (laughs) is a great question. Like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. The, the more you do it, the less they're going to do it. And I don't know about you guys, but I never took care of a car until I bought my own car. And so I think I'm, and my son's, it's a little tornado, and they leave the playroom, or they leave, like there's food everywhere. The other day they ate snacks in our bed, and there was leftover crumbs on my <laughs> wife's side of the bed, and that was not fun to find. No. Um, and just, but it's like, if we come in there and just, we could just do it. But it doesn't teach them. Yeah. And I don't want to do that when they're 19. Or 17 or whenever, you know, I, I just, yeah. so I, they, they got to walk through that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got to. That's good. You know, I think this story might be in the book, but exactly what you just said. Um, Andy walked into, I think it was Andrew's room, maybe one time there were some wet towels on the floor and Andy said, and he's just sitting there, you know, on his phone or reading or doing whatever he was this doing. Is, in, it's in the is book. it in the book? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Andy just looked at him and he said, Hey, I need you to put your phone down for a second and ask me to pick up the towels and hang them up for you. And so he starts getting up like, no, dad, I'll get it. He's like, no, 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 no. Sit down. Stay right there. Ask me to pick up your towels and put them in your room. And this was so hard for Andrew to say because, I mean, for obvious reasons. But what Andy was telling him, he said, this, by you leaving a wet towel, towel on the floor, you are basically saying, mom is going to pick that up for me or dad is going to pick that up for me. The towel's not staying on the floor because we don't want moldy carpet in our home. So I just need you to ask me. And he forced Andrew. Finally, he was like, Dad, would you pick up my towels and hang them up in my bathroom for me? And I'm telling you, it was so humiliating for Garrett, I mean, for Andrew to have to ask his dad to do that. But to your point, how long do you want to be the one picking up the wet towels off the floor? Figure out a way to train your kids to do it. And sometimes it means you know, go into the root of it. The root of it is he's not going to do it. He's expecting somebody else to do it for him. He knows it's not going to stay there. So yeah. address it at that root level. Yeah. And when it comes to sticking to your guns on discipline, and you kind of hinted at this a minute ago, um, it's like, what do you, you got to make sure, what gun are you sticking to? 
you know, you have probably seen the McGinnis Boys on Sunday mornings um, are sponsored by Under Armour and Nike. Um, <laughs> like they're, whenever we get something from Vestavia City Schools and it says like at this event, church closed, we're like, no, 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 boys, no, no, um, not church closed for you. <laughs> this means you wear khakis. Um, <laughs> Let's define church clothes. We have no church yeah. clothes in our house. Like, I could not possibly care less. I decided a long time ago I was not going to raise children that had to dress in a way to go to church that would somehow be connected to my reputation as the lead pastor. I just wanted to be in church and be like here. And they're like, if they want to wear a Nike t-shirt and Nike shorts to be at church, and they're usually wearing those things and serving in our kids' ministry. And what I want them to do is love coming to church and love serving mm -hmm. and love the local church. And, but if I'm, so the question for us is like, why would I make, now, and everybody has different values. So, but for us, I'm like, I, there's no gun to stick to there for me. Like that's not a, bib, khakis aren't biblical, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're not biblical. Never serving seen a verse. serving yeah. is biblical. <laughs> so that, you don't have a choice in our house. You have to serve somewhere. So yeah, that's just it. Um, and speaking, this kind of goes to that. What daily habits of discipleship did you implement with your kids throughout each life stage? Melissa, I know this is something you've done well. I'm, I'm sure all of you guys have tried to do this. I know you and Andy did. You want to touch sure. on that? Um, Sandra touched on it well. I mean, we just started out, um, and, and we talk about this in kids' ministry, just being intentional with the moments that are already a part of your day. So, for us, bedtime in the early stages was a huge deal. That's when we would read a Bible story. Um, we would pray with our kids every night. And then when they got a little older, we let them kind of plan a devotion that they would teach the whole family. So we would sit down. And we would find moments for this. So my kids were had a soccer player, have a baseball player. So there's just some seasons that were difficult, but summer tended to be one that we had more time. So we recognized that and we used it to our advantage. So the kids would go by and they would plan their devotion. We let them lead our family that night. Um, and so that was really fun uh, just to get to see the different things that they would come up with. Um, and then we just encourage, you know, now it's a little bit like, hey, what's God teaching you? You know, in these coaching years, what's he teaching you? I'd love to hear what he's teaching you. And um, they're all reading my two oldest are reading the Old Testament and just getting to hear from them, like what God is teaching them through that has been just really interesting. And then kind of just sharing with them, here's what God's teaching me. And so that's kind of how we do things now in our family. And even last night, my husband and son are out of town, but we, I just sat down with my girls and we still pray together. I'm like, hey, tell me what's going on in your life. What can I, I was like, I'm praying for you, but what can I specifically be praying for you right now? And we just had a time of prayer before um, they went to bed. So that's kind of what it's looked like for us. I mean, we've had devotion books. I wanted to teach them, especially in those elementary years, like, hey, I want you to have your own time with God. And, and sometimes I would sit down and do it with my kids um, in those elementary years just to kind of teach them. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what it's looked like in our house. What are y'all doing with little ones? Yeah, so we, we read Bible stories at bedtime. I mean, not every night, but um, when, when, when they show interest in that, that's, we, we do that with Campbell. Campbell asks the most insightful questions hmm. about Bible stories. Um, and uh, oftentimes you're tired and you're ready to get him to bed and you want to shut that down. I would encourage you to, um, to engage that curiosity and to go down those rabbit trails with him. My son is very, uh, he's very into David and Goliath. He loves that story. And he's trying to figure out well, why, why David's the good guy. Mm. And that's a really good question. And, and so I was like, well, I got to go study. I got to go figure out why is David the good guy? Why, why is it okay that he killed Goliath? Because the last thing I want is my kid coming home with a note from his, his teacher being like, your kid threw a rock at his friend, <laughs> but it's okay, he said, because that's what good guys do, <laughs> right? So training him the actual ethics behind that story and not just reading him yeah. a Bible story in the, yeah. just like it's in there and engaging yeah. those questions and, and actually going there with him, um, even, <clears throat> at, even at that young age. But I'll say, I think the key to discipleship with your kids, uh, with, with a friend, whatever it is, is modeling it. Mm. Um, you know, Paul says this thing in Scripture where he says, follow me as I follow Jesus. And I'm always like, that's so arrogant. But that's really what it's about. 
Yeah. If you're not following Jesus, and I mean tangibly following him, if you're not in your word, if you're not meeting with friends, talking about how following Jesus affects your life, if, if the gospel means nothing to you, it will mean nothing to your children. And so model it. Model it for your kids. I mean, the best thing my parents ever did for me, they were pastors, um, and some of PK, that's why I have all the issues I have. We can talk about it later. But the best thing they did for me is they were real about it. They modeled it for me. And I knew that it mattered to them because the time they invested in it. And so it, the time you invest in it uh, matters. And you kids, your kids will see that, and it will affect them, and they will um, begin to absorb that into, into their lives as well. Mm-hmm. I think it, this feels like it's planned. Encourage it, model it, and then make it easy. Make it easy for your kids. In every season of their life, make sure they've got an age-appropriate Bible and all the little tools that they need. Um, every Easter in my kids' Easter baskets, even now that they're even they're, now that they're adults, um, I have all the things, you know, the chocolate and the flip-flops, all the things you put in an Easter basket, um, but I always have quiet time tools of some sort in their Easter basket, something that will, you know, help them take a step in their faith journey. So in certain seasons with our boys, it might be a biography of an athlete who's, you know, learning how to use his athletics and share the gospel, you know, or just their testimony or something. Um, Age-appropriate Bibles for Allie. She's so creative. She loved journals and pens and highlighters and all the things. Um, But encourage it and then model it and then make it easy for your kids. Make sure they have what they need and they understand, you know, the best time of day based on, you know, are they a night person or a morning person or, you know, so model it, encourage it, and then figure out how to make it easy for them and make sure they have everything they need to have a development emotional time and to let that become part of the rhythm of their lives. Yeah, that's good. And man, just the local church, you yeah. know, you get, you get to choose who influences your kid. Josh is back there. Wave your hand, Josh. Student pastor, you mentioned today, you get to, let them you partner know, be with a part you. of student ministry, yeah. Melissa and kids ministry. And um, that's why I believe being a part of local church is I get to choose the people who are invested in their lives um, and that's the kind of people I want to invest in their lives. Okay, this is the last one, and then we're going to be good. This has been so good. Thank you, Sandra. This has been so good. Um, uh, somebody asked about the if-then, talking about that their parent, their, their mom was kind of like, um, did a lot of the if-then. If you clean your room, then you can go to the movies with your friends. And what do you think about this? I mean, I feel like, oh, man, every parent has done that, right? There is... <laughs> We all I do that. We do that with teenagers. Like, no, you can go eat with your friends when you, you know, mm-hmm. if you pick up the room. I don't know, but that can be that can be bad and discipline too. So you know, I think it depends on the stage of of your of your kids. What you know, how old they are and all that. I think there is a real life principle: is we do what we have to do so that we can do what we want to do. And I think that's important. That's I think good. that applies here. Um, it you know, you just have to look at the rhythm of your family and what your kids typical helpfulness is and all of that. It may be that, you know, in order to do what you want to do, we have to start with what we have to do. So, um, that's a life principle, right? Work, yeah, it is. Right? That's exactly that's right. Anybody else got an if then thought? Well, it's just really funny cause we have a, a chore chart in our kitchen and it rotates four kids each get a week of the month. So it's real simple, but at the very top years ago, I put this label and it says, if you do your chore, if the chore is done, then you can go have fun. And so That's it's great. if that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, I, I tell them, like, there, there are six people here. And right now they're all teens. So it's like six adults in a house. And as we talked about the towels on the floor, I'm like, you live here. Mm-hmm. Why do I have to empty the dishwasher? Because it's your week. <laughs> well, why? But, 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 but. Do you eat here? Yeah. Do you create yeah. dishes? <laughs> then, yes, you got to help out. Hey, you know, trying to train them all to do their laundry so they can leave the houses you know, efficient adults that they can go yeah. to school and do their laundry. Um, so there is, I think, a little bit of that. It's training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is. And, and it's helpfulness. But I'm also, hey, we're a family. Um, just yeah. just like here at church, we're a family. It takes a lot of people to make this house run. It takes a lot of people to make my, my personal house run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. I've been known to use the black trash bag, big black trash bag. Ooh, I've thought of that. Yeah. Things disappear. I've, no, I've been known to just take, you know, you were told, two or three times to clean up the clothes. And then, so I just take them up in a black trash bag. They go into storage and, yep. and then like, where's my just shirt? Where's my shirt? Oh, well, like, <laughs> you don't have access to them now because yeah. you were asked to put them in dirty clothes or to put them up. And so they belong to me now because my house. 
<laughs> I told you I'm mean. Now listen, I told you. Yeah, I've been You're known to do that. To that may have happened in the last four or five years, even pre-toddler. Yeah, that, I mean, did I'm, you do any time in the military? No. <laughs> But <laughs> you were raised by a colonel, right? I was. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just get more chores. If they, they just get more have, chores. Yeah. They have a certain amount of time. They know we clearly state by the end of the day, this has to be done. In fact, my husband and I just switched places at a baseball tournament, and he was like, hey, just so you know, when you get home, if Brooke hasn't mowed the lawn. <laughs> and he, he said she might be mowing the lawn because she didn't fill the fridge, and so she got the... She's mowing wow. the lawn today. So nice. Can Brooke come to my house? <laughs> sure. She apparently called Sean three times with <laughs> having trouble figuring out the mower, but it yeah. got done. It, it was done when I got home last I'm going to do it, Dad, but I'm going to make it painful. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, all right. Well, hey, can you give Sandra a hand and just say thank you? And... Uh, Really grateful to have uh, all these amazing people on yes. our team. So that's a pretty awesome. Hey, I want to pray for Sandra and then pray for you. And uh, we'll, we'll be done today. And she's going to sign some books after this if you want to get your, your book signed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the honor and privilege of being parents. Mm -hmm. There's not a single one of us in this room who feels like we are adequately equipped to do this job, Lord. And yet you have entrusted these little ones and now sometimes older ones and grown ones to us to steward their lives, their, their faith, their, their, um, just their future. And it can be overwhelming. God, we, we just want to hand it over to you, Lord. Would you just empower these parents here to, uh, to be who you've called them to be? And their, their way is going to be a little bit different than my way or Sandra's way or any of this team's way. Help them to be who you've called them to be, to be the parents that you have created them to be. And Lord, I just know this, that you gave those children to those parents because you believe in that person and every person in this room to raise that kid. And you'll give them all that they need, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray for Sandra. We continue to lift up her and Andy as just they lead this incredible ministry at North Point. Would you continue to draw people there who, um, uh, who, are, who are searching for Jesus and help them to find him there? And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Is Sandra going to be out there? Is that what we're going to do? I think that's what we're